Welcome to the third episode of the Build Your People podcast with Kathy Hum. I'm your co-host, Jen DeWeese, and I'm also the president of the Maryland Center for Construction and Education and Innovation, or MCCEI. At MCCEI, our mission is to inspire, educate, and connect a diverse population to careers in the built environment. Joining Kathy and I today are Lauren Chenning of Coakley and Williams Construction and Julie Pingle of Gilbane. The four of us are going to be talking about how to manage people, how to train your managers, and how to create a culture of mutual respect. Today's Build Your People episode is brought to you by our two sponsors, Shapiro and Duncan, and the Johns Hopkins University Facilities and Real Estate Team, or JHFRE. When it comes to providing cutting edge mechanical engineering and construction solutions, including design build, fabrication, installation and maintenance services that promote sustainability at every stage of the building's life cycle, Shapiro and Duncan is a leader in the Washington DC market. A third generation family owned business, Shapiro and Duncan has been serving customers in the DC area since 1976. They are the provider of choice for complex commercial, government and institutional design build projects that require first rate performance, work quality and customer service. JHFRE is the dedicated group responsible for managing and maintaining the state-of-the-art facilities and real estate assets of Johns Hopkins University. With a commitment to excellence and a focus on innovation, the JHFRE team plays a vital role in providing an exceptional environment supporting the institution's mission of research and education. JHFRE provides a comprehensive range of services to support the diverse needs of the Johns Hopkins community. Their dedicated professionals specialize in capital projects and planning, facility operations, transportation services, real estate and property management, and sustainability. Both Shapiro and Duncan and JHFRE are hiring, so look for links to apply in the description below. All right, welcome to the third episode of Build Your People podcast with Kathy Hum. I am your co-host, Jen Sproul, and I'm also the president of the Maryland Center for Construction, Education, and Innovation. At MCCI, our mission is to inspire, educate, and connect a diverse population to careers in the built environment. With me today is our podcast co-host, Kathy. Um, She is an HR professional and founder of NTP HR LLC. Hi, Kathy. How are you today? Hi, good. How are you, Jen? I'm great. And Kathy and I have some guests today. Lauren Mm -hmm. Schenning, Director of Human Resources for Coakley & Williams Construction, and Julie Pingle talent management director for Gilbane. Before we dive into our conversations, why don't we each take a moment to introduce yourselves, how long you've been in the business of recruitment and retention with the, within the construction space and what your own personal philosophy is on it. I'm gonna go Julie. Sure, hi, thank you. Uh, great to be here with all of you this morning. So um, talent management director with Gilbane, I've been with the company uh, a little over 19 years, have sort of grown up in the HR space here at Gilbane, started way back as a HR administrator way back in uh, 2001. Uh, so sort of learned as I went and about three years ago shifted over to the talent management side of the house. So I'm using all of my HR experience and now overseeing uh, performance management, talent review and succession uh, and our leadership and manager development. Um, and uh, at Gilbane, we believe that um, uh, Gil- an employee is a resource that's never fully developed. And so we continue to focus on learning and, and development for our folks. It's a, it's a very strong focus and in fact, have an even greater focus on it now moving forward than we've had in the last you know 10 plus years. Um, so it's kind of a reinvigorating time, if you will, to be in the learning and talent space at Gilbane. We're very excited about the future and lots of um, lots of focus on it and resources being provided as well so that we can actually continue uh, to build our our offerings and uh, programs that we provide to our employees. That sounds awesome. Thanks for sharing. Lauren. 
Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be a part of, of this, um, this group here. So I've been in the commercial real estate industry for over 20 years. Uh, more recently in the general contracting side for the past three and a half, almost four years. So really interesting in making that switch over from commercial real estate to the general contracting side. Um, and with that, I've done everything in the book with human resources, which also includes that talent um, aspect and, and growth opportunity there. So uh, for me, really focusing in as the director of human resources over at Coakley and Williams Construction. And with that, it's really investing in our team members and looking at this as a career and not just a job. I think, as Julie said, it's a great time in our industry to continue to show that career path and growth and prosper that you can have here. And so looking at the learning development pieces, you know, how do we invest in our company culture and really looking at our workforce and how we continue to grow and create that career path for our team. So really excited to discuss the topics here today. Awesome. So as uh, Kathy knows, uh, last episode, we introduced what we were, um, that we have often have an issue in the construction industry on who we promote to people managers. Most often, a successful project manager is given a team of people to manage, usually APMs and project engineers, with no real training on how to do so. Now we know that you, your companies do have that training and that's why we've invited you guys here today. But a small company that's growing um, that maybe just, just started an HR department, they probably do not have that learning and development in place. Because we know that managing people is different than managing a project. Obviously a projects are run by people, but it, it can be different. Probably anybody that's a great people manager would hopefully be a great project manager as well, but often not in reverse. So Kathy, like you said, we, we did invite these two women here because their companies have figured out this process. But before we dive into that, um, what they are actually doing, why don't you, Kathy, lay out the framework for how you think a company should tackle this issue? So it's interesting uh, in the construction space, it's for, for years and years and years, it's been about the project. You know, we build buildings and um, there was very little emphasis on we build people <laughs> and people are our most valuable asset in any organization. I think I've seen a big shift after COVID or through COVID and after that, um, you know, people, employees are looking for things differently and they're looking at their job a little differently and they want, they want, you know, a positive work culture. They want that work-life balance. They they you know, want to get out of bed each day and feel excited about what they're doing. So there has been some shift in, I would say, in a positive direction towards the people culture. And um, it's really important that we focus on this. And I'm really excited to hear about Julie's journey at Gilbane and Lawrence at Coakley Williams, because like you had mentioned, Jen, all too often we we take somebody who's good at their job technically and we throw them into a management position and hope it sticks. And in some cases, those managers are not really effective people managers. They may be independent contributors and how do we carve that out for them? Um, but I think it's really important to go back to basics and offer these people some sort of internal training on management 101. You know, how do you have ongoing conversations about performance and development? How do you deal with um, disciplinary issues? How do you write and give a performance appraisal? How do you write and give a performance improvement plan? Um, even how do you terminate somebody with grace and respect? But we don't teach that typically as organizations. So going back to the basics, and if you don't have it in your organization, you know, find somebody who can teach that. I just did an interesting management development one-on-one class with one of my um, one of my clients, and we brought all the managers from the field, an excavation company, and we had really young people to really old people, and it was such an invigorating conversation. But just back to the basics. So that that's and the other thing too, I'd like to add, Jen, is that I think we really need to understand are the, the makeup of our workforce. What generations are we dealing with in our workforce? 
So before you do any type of training, do an assessment, a survey of your workforce. HR has that data where you can, you know, how many Gen Zs do you have? How many Gen Xs? How many millennials? How many baby boomers? And uh, there's a lot of studies out there on the generations and what they're looking for and how they want to be treated in the workplace. Absolutely. I would imagine looking at that data, you would see where your gaps are going to be yeah, um, yeah. in a little bit of time too. You know, if, if you're, you know, um, baby boomer heavy, um, you better be hurry up and recruiting some younger generations because you, they're not going to be with you for very long. Right. So, um, you know, you, you spoke a, a bit about shifting to a people mindset. Um, Obviously, both Coakley and Williams and Gilbane have that people mindset. Um, Julie, did you want to, or, or Lauren, talk about how your company did that? Well, let me say, first of all, that I think um, it's, a, it's a constant work in progress, if you will, right? We have, to, we have to remind ourselves every day that we have to put our people first. The bottom line is the bottom line, right? We have to make money. The projects have to be successful. But we also have to keep in mind to what Kathy said, we're not selling widgets, we are selling the abilities of our people. Um, and so we are trying to do whatever we can to make that very evident um, that our people are so important. And we're using data in many ways to do that. Um, you know, we look very hard and long at our engagement scores. Um, you know, are we seeing are we seeing any um, trends there around particular business units or even down to a manager level um, where we can really pinpoint places where perhaps our people aren't being put first? Uh, we absolutely read our comments that we see on these engagement surveys. We look at our exit survey data, all of those kinds of things as, as ways to get better at putting people first, honestly. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find places where we might be falling down on those promises that we have made to folks. Are we giving you the development that we've told you that you're entitled to and that you should be getting? Um, so when we see issues like that or challenges like that crop up in our either engagement scores or exit survey data, you know, we, we are trying to take action on those things. We want to go back and talk to those business units, those leaders. Here's what we're seeing. Let's, let's put some things in place to stop this from happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, you know, our team members are a very good reminder of why we're all here. So, you know, I think it's really important to continue to ask the questions and ask for feedback, you know, as, as Julie mentioned with the engagement surveys, but even after events, after programs, after trainings, really asking for that feedback and then taking that feedback and turning it into action items. Um, and I think that it can range into something small or something large, but it's really looking at that feedback as an organization and continuing to ask for it is really important as the culture will always continue to evolve. So tagging on to that, you're mentioning feedback, which and um, you know engaging after after a company event or or so, anything. Um, that's obviously one way to engage your employees. What are some other strategies that you can use can, where you can be intentional about that feedback so you make sure that you are living up to the culture you want to have? Yeah, I think that. Um, really the, the training aspect, I'm thinking a lot about that learning and development component is that, you know, we want to hear what our employees want. And, you know, we do a, a coaching catalytic coaching process where it's future forward and forward facing. So we're not just looking at the past, it's really moving forward in that direction. So how do you continue to solicit, but then engage and, and act on that? So it is that follow through piece that's really important as well and saying, we hear you. Um, whether that's, you know, discussing it in an all company hands on meeting or if it's a quarterly review or a business unit specific review, just depending on where that goes. I, I think it's really important to not only solicit the feedback and take it and have those action items, but then responding and saying, we hear you. We want to work with you and we understand where you're coming from. And here's what we're doing to um, to work towards this, you know, change or um, or continuing to to do things that are are going well. You know, we we love that feedback as well, right? Like this is the strength of the organization. Let's continue to grow off of that. 
So I think it's also addressing that, you know, we hear you and we're moving forward with the feedback, but how we're doing that and then talking about it afterwards as well to make sure that it's measurable and successful. Jen, I also wanted to add, I think it's really important when we're developing our people, when you're having that those ongoing coaching sessions and I'm a strong proponent for ongoing feedback, at least quarterly, really, I think it should be monthly, even more, but uh, we, we get it, we're in construction and, and it's a challenge. Um, but um, helping people understand their strengths and helping them live into them and, and stop putting into them you know, we need to build your weaknesses, find their strengths, and let's really just um, help people flourish within their strengths and, and build around them maybe the strengths that they don't have with other people. And, you know, another way of saying this is do they, are they in the right seat on the bus and uh, helping them really um, catapult their career by understanding those strengths and living into them? I mean, as um, a former um, employee, um, it's the same. I, I remember thinking, oh, well, I'm not so great at these things. But in the last like year and a half, two years, I've switched to the, right, these are my strengths and I'm going to lean into them. Yeah. And I've seen just, I mean, the shift in mindset of myself mm -hmm. um, and feeling more empowered and not, and more successful because I know what I'm good at and now I'm, I'm trying to lean into those things um, has been great, but I feel like I'm a better manager um, as a result because I know what I'm good at. And then I outsource uh, mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. as, you know, as the, as running a nonprofit, I can outsource the things that I'm not great at, but also it's, it's a more positive mindset. Um, and I imagine as, as somebody who was often tasked with things that I w was not great at, um, I'm not saying that I couldn't do it, but I didn't like it. If you're not great at something, you often don't enjoy doing it. And then you spend the majority of your life at work. Why wouldn't you want to do something that you like doing? So it, it makes sense. Um, it, it's always the thing that you put to the bottom of your list if it's not something you like doing. Uh, and it, it's kind of imagine the amount of resources spent on trying to train somebody on something that they're not great at doing either would be immense. Makes sense. Yeah. And Jen, if you don't mind, I, you know, talking about where people's skill sets match as well, I think, you know, the majority of our team members in our industry, I mean, we're so fortunate to be in this incredible industry that the people that are in it really have a passion for what we do. So how do we as an organization really support that passion, right? That's really the differentiator between our company and, and other companies, but really supporting the passion for our industry. And how do you continue to invest in our team members that way? So that's really something that we try to focus on as well as that passion for what we do. And that can look to be in a lot of different ways, not just that day-to-day -day task, you know, within your job description, but getting involved in things outside of the day-to-day -day work as well. That's great. So, you know, you're, you're have a very, a cult people forward culture. Um, obviously every company has a culture, whether or not they know they have a culture that could not be an intentional culture. Um, but say a business owner, you know, they say, these are our values, right? Um, and then they do some feedback um, sessions and realize, well, these are what we're saying our values are. But if you really look at what our employees are saying, they don't match up. What do you suggest um, to any business owner or HR professional um, when they realize that their culture doesn't really align with the vision for which they're looking? You know, we're hoping mutual respect, but if that's not it, what are our next steps? Uh, I think that's a, that's an interesting one for sure, Jen. Um, I, I, you know, I'll say again, we we heavily rely on our employee engagement surveys. Um, to really make sure that our, we're walking the talk, uh, if you will, talking the, uh, you know, walking the, the walk of our core values that we share on day one with everyone. Um, I, I will say that I think we're maybe we're fortunate. I don't know that we've had major misalignment, but certainly if we see it, then we're, we ask um, the business leaders where we're seeing it to, to act upon that and, and really work hard to ensure that things change. Um, if you're really seeing major misalignment, wow, that's a good one. Lauren, what are you guys, have you seen that? That's, that's tough. 
No, that that is a tough one. I, I think we've been fortunate to feel like we're aligned, right? I know that our leadership team really took a lot of time to look at that mission and those core values and and then really implement them across the organization. And I know that at any time, if things don't align, we're not afraid to revisit. And that's the biggest thing is being open to that. And I think the other thing too, is that we know that leadership can set the tone with that culture, but it's not just leadership's mm -hmm. responsibility. It really is everyone across the organization that has to uh, be responsible for what our culture is because our leaders aren't working with every single person on a day-to-day -day basis. So if the things are out of alignment, if the culture is out of alignment or the mission or, or core values, then that really needs to be discussed. But We've been fortunate. I don't think we've really had that big of a misalignment on our side either, but that can be a challenge, I imagine. Absolutely. Great, great point. The other thing I'll say is that I think uh, it's really important that you're hiring for the right uh, fit there as well. So make sure that whatever those core values are or that company culture that you're trying to make sure, you know, carries through that, that that's part of your recruitment um, uh, package there, making sure that you're asking questions about that at the time of hire. Some of my, my clients are smaller companies, and um, I really appreciate, Julie and Lauren, that your companies are well aligned. What I'm finding with the smaller trade partners, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, you ask them, what are your values? They may not have them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's setting clear expectations um, I'm a strong proponent for strategic planning and understanding what you're going to be working on over the next year or three years, um, year, three, five years, whatever your duration is. But having a vision, having corporate values or, um, you know, um, cultural, whatever you call them, but, you know, core values and then setting clear expectations and being transparent and, and communicating that regularly and often. And I would venture to guess that Coakley and Gilbane do that. Um, so that would be my recommendation for the smaller companies is to have a vision, have core values, create them if you don't have them, and then be very clear and, and set clear expectations and transparent and use that language often. And that's where hopefully you'll get alignment and that creates a good culture. So, we, you know, we talked about um, companies, smaller companies, creating those core values um, and whatnot. So switching gears a tiny little bit, how do you recommend those same companies, what they should start doing to create that learning um, and development plan for their people to become people managers? Well, I'd like to start. I think there should be some training for people who are going into a management role where they'll have direct reports. Oftentimes, they're elevated into a position and they have direct reports and they really don't know what they don't know. Um, you know, that, that can be as simple as, you know, going through what are some things they need to be doing, whether it's the coaching engagement that Coakley Williams has or quarterly check-ins or what have you, how to do a performance appraisal, how do you handle difficult situations, how do you have those crucial conversations. If it's something that you can't handle internally, there are gobs of, you know, uh, webinars, Associated Builders and Contractors usually has some things that they offer to help managers with people management. So I, I really think we're doing them a disservice if we throw them into the position and we don't give them any type of training to lead direct reports. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, so I guess what you're you're saying is even if you don't have a learning development department within house, then we can absolutely outsource that work. Mm -hmm. um, so then I guess how would a how does a, a CEO figure out what their manage what they want their management style to be? Because there's a million of them out there. So like how did how did you guys figure out um, you know what what the right resources were when you were training your employees? Uh, gosh, let's see. How did we find out? I, I think that um, 
we've been fortunate to partner with uh, some external vendors to provide a lot of our leadership development training. We've developed some in-house as well. Um, but I, I think we don't necessarily require that everyone have the same leadership style, I guess I would say, but there's definitely some foundational behaviors that, you know, that we want folks to, to focus on. And um, when I was thinking about this question, I, the biggest thing that comes into my head is just don't wait until they're people managers to start developing them, right? There are, there are foundational skills that, that our folks need that will only serve them well in their future, whether or not they're a people leader or not. And, and things like having self-awareness, that emotional intelligence piece is so important to everything we do as employees or people leaders, right? And there's some other, you know, foundational behaviors and skills, strong communication skills are so important, whether or not you're a people leader down the line or not. So I, I think that where we're focused these days is really making sure that that those foundational skills are are being um, you know achieved and, and and that people are getting them before they're ready to be people leaders and then there's that more th those more maybe I don't know tactical if that's the right word but as you were talking about you know how do you have a performance review discussion how do you give feedback uh, appropriately how do you coach we have specific learning um, you know modules around that uh, as well so I think the biggest the biggest takeaway here is just don't wait. <laughs> don't wait until they're already a people leader. And we've learned that lesson kind of the hard way, honestly, at Gilbane. Yeah. They have the, um, you know, my former previous company um, created, they created emerging leaders programs, which mm -hmm. were, you know, nine month program. Mm -hmm. So going back to associated builders and contractors, they have the leadership development programs that, you can get your rising stars in whether they have direct reports or not to um, really understand the nuts and bolts of leadership and development management. Speaking of that, um, NEWIC actually just launched their very first leadership. It's women specific mm. leadership cohort. Nice. So if you have right. as, as an organization or realize that you maybe have some unconscious bias that these are happening within your organization. That's a way to help women because it is women in this industry definitely have a different um, mm -hmm. experience than their male counterparts oftentimes. Yeah. And I, I like what, um, you know, Julie was saying, I think the best way to develop people managers is to really develop what's best in that manager. You know, we don't require a set, you know, form of, uh, of ways of thinking, right, or attitudes for things. I mean, we really want people to, to bring their differences to the table. You know, we know we're stronger when our differences come together and make it more of that inclusive and diverse environment. So looking at what's best in the manager, um, I think there's ways to get potential leaders of people into leadership positions without having that people aspect right off the bat. You know, it's managing projects or doing side, you know, work with like a, a women in construction group or um, the young leaders group, you know, there's ways to get involved with leadership outside of that, but mm -hmm. really trying to foster that environment for new leaders, you have to look beyond just performance and understanding what an employee's desire is and the aptitude to grow and, you know, do they want to develop others? And are they able to cast a vision and look beyond, you know, just that day to day work? And how do they communicate? And really looking at those competencies that make up, you know, potential good leaders. And, you know, like Julie was saying too, that base knowledge of that foundational of, of who we are as a company as well, like what our story is. So I think there's lots of ways to get yeah. people involved in that. Lauren, I love that. Um, I worked for a small general contractor when I was in project management and we were all asked to join a board, um, not get into an organization, but join a board. And I think mm -hmm. they realized by doing so, not only are you networking and creating your network and that yeah. that's, I think what they were really hoping is that we would build a network, but I developed my leadership skills well beyond what, mm -hmm. what I was able to do, even in my day to day, if I was given one person to manage, it was totally different than mm -hmm. running an entire association. Yes, it was a volunteer position, but you've got a board under you and everything. And I say that all the time, my involvement with NEWIC and how involved I got, that's why I have my job today. It, I mean, yes, my, my day to day job prepared me, but not to the extent that, so it is really smart. Um, it's a, it's like free training for yeah. your company. Yeah. All you're paying is for the membership, but 
it, I mean, I went through all kinds of leadership training when I was in NEWIC. I learned how to write strategic plans and um, delegate and it was great. It was absolutely wonderful. So that is really, I never even thought about that as a way um, for, I always, I talk about it all the time as an employee, but mm -hmm. as, a, as an owner, that's a, such a smart strategy. Yeah, I think it's important you do take on those stretch assignments, you raise your hand, you know, women tend to want to know something 100%, you know, take those stretch assignments, you know, get involved in a board or a committee, do something with community service or what have you, whatever floats your boat, but, you know, get involved and yeah, your, your skill set just becomes that much stronger. Absolutely. We talked a little bit about you know, leaning to the strengths of an employee and helping them develop that. So what happens when you've given somebody um, a management position in which they have people under them and you've coached them and trained them and it's just not clicking, like they're not the best, but they're amazing at their technical skills at their job. What, do you, what are you guys doing? Um, do you have career opportunities and growth opportunities for those individuals and how do you support them? So you don't want to lose their, that part of them. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, just the, the truth is not everyone wants to manage people, right? They love what they do. They're passionate about it. But the people aspect, that's a different component. It's another level to their day-to-day -day work. And so they may not want to do that. And how do we help people build the capacity for the things that matter to them? And so, you know, I know that we've utilized individuals in more of the training opportunities where they really become that subject matter expert and they're able to talk to other team members about their expertise, right? What they're passionate about, what they are known as the SME for. Um, so I think that there's ways to get people involved with training and leadership and development opportunities outside of that people aspect, but then also can we get them involved in outside associations and organizations and be on boards and be present for that aspect. So they're still representing themselves in the company and, and learning and networking just in a different capacity. Smart. Very smart. Yeah, I think one of the things companies should before try to avoid is if somebody is not a good people manager, kind of think outside of the box, you know, before, you know, knocking them down a peg, mm -hmm. are they independent contributors to the company? And what does that look like? If it means possibly creating another position or moving them into something that they would much rather prefer to do, really think about that too, as opposed to, oh, they can't manage people. You know, we, we need to put somebody in that position that can and think outside of the box. One of the things that I'd love uh, for us to do here at Gilbane, we're not doing it yet, but I have it sort of on our roadmap for a few years out, is to sort of opt in to being a people leader, right? Mm -hmm. If it's not something that you're truly passionate about, um, then let's talk about that and let's be honest and transparent and have those conversations before you're ever put into that role uh, so that, you know, you don't end up in a situation where you've got someone really poorly managing their team, they're unhappy, the team's not working. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things I'd love to see us do. There are some companies out there that actually ask you to sort of re-opt in to being a people leader every year around the performance review time frame. I've read about that. I think that's a great idea. It's almost like you're signing a contract, right? I agree to do this because it is a whole nother level of complexity um, in your daily role. So I think that's a, I think that's an interesting idea. It's great. So uh, one way that uh, companies I have worked for um, that they have um, helped with that culture and getting everyone on the same page is uh, through books company everyone reading maybe not a whole company i have been in places where everyone is asked to read the book but maybe all the management team will read the same book or whatever so are are there any books or podcasts um since we are on one of those right now that you can re recommend for someone who wants to improve their people leadership skills i have several that my top three i would recommend are the advantage by patrick lancioni which is all about organizational health has the pyramid of trust which is the you know behave five behaviors of a cohesive team it's the manager by jim clifton and jim carter uh, not carter harder 
and First Break All the Rules by Jim Harder. They're all fantastic books that speak up, you know, around this topic. What do you love about them? Um, I think, well, first break all the rules is essentially what the title says is, you know, kind of break it down to, to um, the essentials. It's all about the manager. It's not about the person. Look within, um, you know, try to understand um, what your, um, what your impact is to a relationship within the workplace and how can you make things better and help your team develop. And the advantage is the one that has the trust pyramid with the behaviors of, of, of um, a cohesive team. So, Yeah, I, um, I also uh, like Patrick Lencioni, uh, the five dysfunctions of a team. So it's a leadership fable, part fable, part business handbook. And it just helps people understand how each of the, the five key behaviors of successful teams really build upon one another and, and really holding teams back when not understood. So they're looking at, you know, what a healthy environment looks like, what dysfunction looks like, and then how to overcome that dysfunction. But they make it in a fun way. He's really very, very good at that. Very cool. Very engaging. Julie? And I have two, actually. Uh, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Okay. Uh, subtitles, How to Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity. Hopefully I can mm -hmm. say that. Um, yes. <laughs> That's a great uh, book. <laughs> I just, I really enjoyed it. I uh, actually just read it again recently. And just, I, I don't know, I just, first of all, it's easy to read. I appreciate business books or books that I are going to help me learn if they're easy to digest. And I, and I really enjoyed that. Um, the other one I really like is Insight by Tasha Yurik, um, which is about self-awareness. Uh, the subtitle is The Surprising Truth About How Others See Us, How We See Ourselves, and Why the Answers Matter More Than We Think. Um, and uh, that's a book that a number of us at Gilbane have read over the last couple of years. Our CHRO happens to know the author. Um, she's got a great TED talk out there as well. So that's a really, a really good book around um, emotional intelligence and self-awareness. So um, one of my favorites um, is Big Potential by uh, Sean Acor. If you haven't read it yet, he is a, um, Sean is a positive psychologist uh, um, out of Harvard, I believe. Um, and that book talks a lot about um, building a team, not necessarily of superstars, um, building, you know, building a team of people with lots of different strengths and diversity and whatnot, and how um, working together, you can accomplish more. It's a, it's a very positive um, book, but also um, yeah, I, it made me read his, um, his other, his first book, which is big, um, The Happiness Advantage. So that's a more, that's more like a personal, a self-help type book, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, Big potential is more for teams. It's, it's pretty great. Awesome. Well, do we have any final closing thoughts before we wrap up? Take care of your people. They're hard to find. You got to keep them. <laughs> the biggest asset right there. We are here because of our people. So right. continuing right. to invest in them is the most important thing. You're here. Totally agree. <laughs> And I, I couldn't agree more either. All right. Well, thank you bo both for joining us. It's been great. You were our first guests ever on our podcast. So thanks for uh, for humoring us. Um, and, uh, and thanks to our listeners uh, for listening to the Build Your People podcast with your hosts, Kathy Hom and Jen Sproul and our guests as well. And we hope you enjoyed our third episode um, as we begin tackling the construction industry's biggest HR issues. Um, you've hired your people. Now you've trained them in, in um, how to be the best managers. So next episode, we're going to talk about defining career paths and putting an emphasis on learning and development in your recruitment and retention strategy. If any of our listeners has a topic or question you'd like us to cover, please share them in the comments. And please check out all the links and resources in the show notes and follow us on social media. That's all for this episode. See you next time.